Uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon, good evening to anyone joining us today. Uh, on behalf of the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative, ITSI, I would like to welcome you all to today's webinar titled Using the IDDSI Flow Test in Clinical Practice. How thick is thick and does thickness really matter? Presented by Carly Barbone. Uh, we'd like to thank you, all the listeners, for being here today and spending the, the next hour with us exploring the process, um, uh, exploring the IDDSI flow test. Uh, we would also like to thank our very generous sponsors who allow the work of ITSI to continue. And you can find more about them through our website, iddsi.org. Before we begin, I'd just like to go through some housekeeping. Uh, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website at the end of the week um, and through our YouTube channel as well. And second, all our participants who are joining us today are in listen-only mode. And this means that the panelists will not be able to hear or see you and that your microphone and video will remain off for the duration of the session. If you like, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, however, feel free to submit them uh, while the presentation is happening. And to do so, uh, all you have to do is click on the Q and A button on the middle of your menu bar at the bottom of your screen, and then submit them to the panelists. Uh, the panelists will then address these questions uh, either throughout the presentation or at the end when we will have about 15 to 20 minutes to do a Q and A period. Um, and lastly, in the upcoming days, a certificate of attendance will be emailed to anyone attending the session uh, today. If you are joining us through a phone line, which I can see we have about 15 people calling in uh, through a phone line, uh, please make sure to email communications at iddsi.org uh, with your name, just so that we can send you a certificate of attendance because we, we just don't know who you are at the moment. Um, but if you're attending through your computer, uh, there's no need to email us. We know who you are and please keep an eye on your email. The, the email that you register with in the next couple of days for the certificate of attendance. Uh, now, moving on to our main presenter of the session, uh, Carly Barbone is a speech language pathologist and a PhD candidate in the Swallowing Rehabilitation Research Laboratory under the supervision of Dr. Katrina Steele. Uh, Carly has research interests in texture modification related to swallowing in patients with head and neck cancer. Carly also has uh, lots of clinical experience with swallowing in a variety of patient populations uh, with her background in measurement uh, of viscosity and flow of liquids. She has extensive experience in accurately testing liquid thickness using the IDDSI flow test. And when she's not doing research, Carly enjoys sipping on a morning IDDSI level zero coffee or the occasional level one slightly thick smoothie. Also joining us in this phone call today is Peter Lamb, uh, co-chair of the ITSI Board of Directors. He will be listening in and answering any particular questions about the framework, the flow test, uh, and or implementation during the Q&A session. And okay, that's it for me. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Carly to get her presentation started. Uh, welcome, Carly, good morning, and go ahead. Good morning, you can hear me? Yes, we can hear All you. Right. Thanks so much, Alan. Um, greetings from Toronto, everyone, uh, whether you're uh, a.m., p.m., mid-afternoon. Um, I just want to thank you so much for joining in today. I'm really excited to be um, here and to be talking about uh, texture modification and the ITSI flow test. Um, I've spent a lot of hours liquid testing in the lab, uh, and I have some tips that I cannot wait to share with you. Uh, Hopefully, they'll make your testing process uh, a little easier. So let's get right into it. Um, now, before I really can get started talking about ITSI testing, I really have to give a nod to the board of directors who really come from a wide range of backgrounds and specialties. Uh, and they have one common interest, and that is standardizing the measurement and the classification of foods and liquids that we use for dysphagia management. So. 
there really, um, you know, who, who we have to uh, thank for all of this work. So today's learning intentions have really one common theme, and that's to better help clinicians and patients feel confident and empowered to use the ITSI flow test, whether that be for implementing a texture modified diet at home uh, or creating contrast stimuli uh, to match video fluoroscopy recommendations. Today, I'm going to be focusing on the the liquid aspect of texture modification or of the ITSE um, framework. So just to start off um, with the, you know, the evidence behind ITSE, there's been a, a growing amount of research in the field relating to texture uh, modification and our need to standardize our system. Um, the initiative really began with ITSE's first publication that you can see here, which stated the need for an international system uh, for our foods and liquids um, that we use with our patients. And most of us have had the really unfortunate event of patients transitioning to us from a hospital um, or even in long-term long care facilities where they presented and had inconsistencies in their diets. Um, and so the lack of standardized nomenclature that we tend to use is quite confusing. And we know, and also research has proven, uh, that it's really hard to be consistent with developing um, thickened liquids, not even, um, you know, from SLP to SLP or dietitian to dietitian, but really within our own mix. So we're not even able to recreate what we um, would like to in terms of um, a repetition of creating texture a modified liquids. And so next, ITSE conducted a systematic review. Uh, this demonstrated the evidence that really thickening does overall help those who tend to aspirate on thin liquids. Uh, now, one longstanding problem is that commercial products are not the same as, um, you know, another commercial product. And so ITSE has really examined many samples and recipes from manufacturers and found that their products can vary significantly. Historically, this has really caused confusion fusion for caregivers and individuals with dysphagia. So there's, a, there's great research going on, um, but unfortunately, because of uh, the terms and definitions that we use, we're really unable to accurately make comparisons and draw really valid conclusions from the results um, of our research findings. So this systematic review then led to the development of the ITSE framework, uh, which includes terminology and outlines for texture modified foods and thickened liquids for us to be able to use. And here are the particular highlights of the systematic review. Um, but what I want to kind of draw your attention to is that what we end up with is a Goldilocks dilemma where we don't really know how thick is too thick and vice versa. So um, how do we, you know, if I, if I pose this question, how do we really look and evaluate objectively the thickness of a liquid in the hospital setting um, that we're giving? And while I let you really um, reflect on that question, Question, I'm going to ask you, are you accurate? Um, and then to add another complicated layer to that, what happens when we add barium to the mix? So this is how ITSE can really help us remain consistent and determine the best consistency for our patients. Uh, this also, you know, and it also makes it clear and objective for both the patient and their families. Um, so we all know why we thicken, and we know that it can help our patients who have difficulty on thin liquids. And so here we have my beautiful swallow. I obviously don't need thickened liquids, but um, how do we accurately test thickness levels and really translate those beneficial levels to our patients? So we use video fluoroscopy, like I have up here on the screen, to determine what we have or what we need to provide to the patients. Um, but then we also have, on the flip side, trouble with liquid preparation after the fact. And so we need to know on the forefront what we are mixing, and how do we know um, that we can see? So when we're creating recipes, are our recipes uh, opaque enough to be able to visualize on the screen? And how does barium impact flow? 
Um, and so these are all really important questions that are imperative to our practice as speech pathologists or anyone conducting video fluoroscopy. Um, and these are all really extremely important uh, and I, I really do aim to answer these during the course of the webinar. So I'm going to get back to contrast, uh, but right now I'd like to go over the ITSE framework a little bit. The role of ITSE is really an important one. It allows us to work with that Goldilocks dilemma that I was talking to you about, but for the patient online. So today I'm going to talk to you specifically about the liquid portion um, and how we can use the ITSE flow test to aid in video fluoroscopy standardization and our clinical recommendations. And we're really all familiar with modifying liquids for patients, so hopefully um, I'm going to be able to help make this easier. And what we're going to be doing is focusing on this right bottom triangle outlined in red here. The triangle works its way from the fastest flowing liquids that you can see there at the base of the triangle and works its way up to the slowest flowing. And then these overlap with the food pyramid. One thing that I will mention that it's really important to be aware of is that the ITSE flow test is not a measure or a test of viscosity. And that's a word that we really use a lot in our field um, or whenever we're talking about texture modified liquids for diet. So we have to start shifting our minds to talk about consistency levels in terms of flow rather than in terms of viscosity. And, you know, our literature does contain a lot of studies where lower technology measurements of flow have been used. Uh, and these include the line spread test that you can see here on the left, and then the Boswick consistometer on the right. And both of these um, low technology methods uh, rely um, on the flow of liquid, um, and they test a flow of liquid across a level surface. Um, and each device really involves determining the distance of the flow of liquid over a specific time period. To look more at this slide here, it shows how the Boswick consistometer works. So basically at the top, the liquid is placed in that small holding chamber on the left and there's a gate. When the gate's released, the liquid flows into a longer um, measurement chamber that you can see is marked with those distant measurements in half centimeters. And so the distance flowed is conventionally measured at 30 seconds. However, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, time and effort is put into this type of testing. A lot of places still use this method, um, but it's quite messy um, and it requires a lot of test stimuli as well. The chamber is quite deep um, and so you have to end up making quite large batches, which can also alter the flow depending on how large your batch is. Um, and it is quite time consuming to both set up and then clean. Um, so we do need you know, a better test of flow. And so speaking of flow, um, with the guidance of Dr. Ben Hansen, who's at the University College London, uh, the ITSE committee settled on a simple flow test, um, and this uses an empty 10 milliliter syringe. Uh, the test is modeled after flow testing that's used in other industries, uh, which use more specific funnels, uh, like the one that you see on the left, the posthumous funnel. Um, and Historically, this funnel was used to measure viscosity of yogurt. Uh, so what you would do is you would put a predetermined amount of liquid and that was allowed to flow through the funnel. And the time to exit the funnel was measured as an index of apparent viscosity. Um, so when we look at the ITSE test on the right, um, to perform the ITSE test, you basically plug the bottom of the syringe with your finger and you fill the chamber with 10 milliliters of your test fluid. Um, when you're ready, you release the finger from the nozzle and allow the fluid to flow from the syringe for 10 seconds. You then replug the nozzle to stop the flow, so it's quite straightforward. Um, the amount of liquid that's left in the syringe determines the fluid level or the consistency on on the ITSE framework. And this test works really well for discriminating between those first uh, four levels. So uh, level zero, one, two, and three. Um, at level four, essentially, you should be having no flow. And at this point, ITSE really recommends that you move to either a fork drip test or the spoon tilt test that I'll be talking about um, towards the end of the webinar. Um, and it's also 
all of the examples are described on the website and on Etsy's YouTube. Um, and so, like I said, we're going to be doing some testing together. I'm going to show you some Etsy tests, but first, I'm actually going to let you know what you need um, specifically to set yourself up for successful liquid testing. So, this next slide is quite critical. And the first piece of information that I have is syringe length is critical. So, just because we test 10 milliliters of flow from the syringe, it doesn't mean that you can fill a larger syringe with 10 milliliters of liquid and perform the ITSY flow test with this large syringe. It doesn't work like that. You're not going to get consistent results. Um, it's, not, it's not a viable um, syringe to use for the ITSY test. So you have to make sure um, the first step is to make sure that you have a 10 milliliter syringe only. Okay, so now that you have that 10 milliliter syringe, now you have to know what specific 10 milliliter syringe to use. Um, and so what I mean by that is that although uh, 10 milliliter syringes are all measurements of the amount of fluid, uh, they're actually not all identical. And so uh, 10 milliliters initially, the syringes were thought to be identical throughout the world based on an ISO standard. Um, and it's a kind of like a standard reference number, but it's subsequently been determined that the ISO document refers only to the nozzle of the syringe and that variability in barrel length and dimensions uh, might exist between brands. So specifically, the ITSY flow test uses a reference syringe with a measured length of 61.5 millimeters. And this measurement is from the zero line to the 10 milliliter line. And these BD syringes were used initially for development of the ITSY test. And so ITSY is aware that there are some syringes that are also labeled as 10 milliliters, but in fact have a 12 milliliter capacity. So just to kind of draw your attention to this because, um, you know, results using a 12 milliliter syringe will be quite different from those using a true 10 milliliter syringe. Um, and the results will not be consistent. And so it's really important to check the barrel length, um, and that can be shown in this diagram here. Now, uh, you can always measure the length of the barrel using a ruler um, to ensure the height of the column of the syringe uh, from zero to 10 is equal to that 61.5 millimeters, or if you have this ITSY card on the left, um, often ITSY will um, have these cards at their booths, at um, you know, different conferences and meetings. Um, so I really encourage you, if you do see an ITSY booth or um, one of the board of directors, I would ask for, for some of these cards because they are extremely, extremely valuable. So if you have one of these cards here on the left, what you can do is align your syringe with the convenient ruler on the left-hand side there. Um, and to this will help you to ensure the proper syringe length. Um, another way to ensure that you're working with the right dimensions is that 10 milliliters of water will exit the correct syringe completely in seven seconds. Um, and so that's a really nice way to check your syringe calibration. I've also provided a list here that you can see on the screen of the current product codes and to be aware that there are new product codes. So the syringes are the same in terms of their dimensions, um, but the shelf carton sizes have changed. So it's important to be aware of these new codes for ensuring the correct syringe test. Um, so for example, the current product code for the slip tip syringe, the BD, um, is 301604. However, they've um, had a new quantity per shelf carton, so that new product code is the 303134, which is the uh, syringe that I highlighted in the previous slide. And so now that we know that we have the correct syringe length, um, now uh, not only are those you know, dimensions important, but so are the types of tips that you use. So because we're working with flow, these are really important details that can't be overlooked. And here are the types of syringe tips that are acceptable and will provide you with really consistent and accurate flow measurements. So you can use the BD lure lock, you can use the lure slip tip, 
You can lose the, use the eccentric lure slip tip. And those are the three that are acceptable for use with the ITSI test. Um, however, you cannot use the catheter tip. Um, so this will alter the flow um, and um, you'll get a different measurement essentially with this type of tip. Um, so just be beware that you have the correct tip. So now that you have the correct um, syringe that you're going to be using for your ITSY testing, I'm gonna give you some kind of tips and tricks to follow um, that have helped me over the course of um, my years of testing liquids. So pre-measurement really helps um, in terms of pre-measuring thickeners. This helps for recreation of your um, your recipes. Now, it's not necessary, um, but it might help, especially if you're working on the development of recipes to use within a facility that you would like to, you know, have standardized in terms of what you're providing. Um, and so you have a standard recipe for your slightly, mildly, moderately, extremely. Uh, this is a really good way to go. And so pre-measuring is really great. Um, I also recommend uh, recording small changes in thickener that you um, um, are adding or taking away in order to, um, you know, adapt your recipes. It's really nice to just keep an Excel spreadsheet or a form um, that has all of those differences and their, um, their resulting flow tests in case you ever want to go back to those um, specifics um, or if you want to recreate maybe something that you didn't want at that particular moment. Um, and so, Pre-packaged thickeners um, and scoops are really great to use, but for accuracy um, and consistency, I highly recommend using a scale. Um, that's because some of the thickeners have grains that are uh, varying in sizes, and so some uh, scoops might be, might be more dense than others and take up more space um, within a scoop in terms of those grains. Uh, so the scoop might up weighing less than it's supposed to or more, and usually on um, on the can, uh, it will tell you what the average scoop size is. So what I end up doing is just really trying to use a scale and just measure um, because you never know how much you're really getting within a scoop. Um, is it level? Is it, you know, um, overloading the scoop? So, um, and also, um, when making textures such as slightly thick or level one, um, which aren't really common in terms of pre-measured thickeners, it's best to use a scale for this as well. Um, I always weigh my thickeners to uh, two decimal places, but in terms of, um, you know, for clinical recipes, um, one decimal point should suffice. Um, also, just to mention the use of thickeners is sometimes pretty finicky and working with thickeners can really prove difficult in terms of how much you're adding to your base liquid, whether it be water, juice, a liquid with a fat content like milk. Um, and so the typical thickeners that we use are starch and gum based. Um, and they're really used to gel or bind to water. And so they may behave differently when fats and sugars are involved. Um, so I really recommend playing around with recipes for thickening water first and using that as your starting point and then expanding onto other beverages that might be provided to your patients that you'd like to um, have thickened. So this way they can have a general boundary of um, you know, a thickener amount for water for each itsy level and then you can vary that in terms of how much you add um, if it's a milk or a juice. Um, so those are just some tips. Uh, in terms of troubleshooting, really all of the above, so bubbles, chunks, and barium can change the flow of the liquid that you're testing. And there are a few ways that we can overcome some of these. Uh, bubbles are also variables that can alter the flow and the corresponding ITSI flow test as a result. So when you're using a syringe to draw up the sample of the thickened liquid, um, bubbles can occur if air gets mixed in with the sample. And so there's something uh, that can occur when you're mixing in a 
thickener, particularly gums. Um, and so in order to prevent bubbles in a test sample, you should first make sure that there's enough liquid in the sample that you are drawing up to prevent air from entering the syringe. So I always make sure I have ample sample <laughs> that I'm not taking the syringe and pushing it towards the bottom of the cup and then drawing up the liquid. I make sure that the syringe is in the middle of the suspension so that I can draw up all of the liquid without any bubbles. Um, and that's kind of the first uh, place where I start. Um, and then when you deliver uh, the sample into the flow test syringe, I always press the nozzle of the loading syringe to the side of the test syringe and make sure to load the sample slowly. Um, and I'll show you an example of that in a few minutes. Um, one of the main challenges with syringe testing has also been making sure that there are no lumps within the stimulus. So even if there are small lumps floating within the suspension, um, this can alter or impede the flow of the liquid through the syringe. And so when this occurs, you don't get really an accurate measurement of flow. There's a few ways that you can decrease the risk of having these lumps in your stimulus. Um, one of the main things is to ensure that the liquid is moving at the time you pour the barium in or add your thickener in. And so while the liquid's moving, pour the pre-measured barium and then the thickener or pour them into the moving water at the same time. Um, you can also mix the barium and the thickener um, together to ensure that there are no chunks. And then after you mix them dry, you can pour them into that moving water. Um, and uh, we in our lab, uh, Katrina had mentioned yesterday's in yesterday's webinar, we do use a stand mixer, but you can also for um, the faster flowing liquids on that continuum. Um, so I would say level zero, while well, you're not adding thickener. So really level one um, and, and sometimes level two, um, you can use um, a magnetic mixer. Uh, you might have to help it a little bit, but at least at the beginning, it can be um, you know slowly disturbing the water so that when you add in your thickener and barium, this really helps to um, disperse your, your particles and help to um, eliminate chunks. And so here's kind of what I'm talking about in terms of loading. And so there's two options that I'm demonstrating here. Hint, the best one is in the green, and it's the best way to avoid bubbles. And this is using uh, my favorite slip, uh, or my favorite tip, which is the slip tip syringe. Um, so on the left, what you're seeing is the liquid being loaded with a lure lock. So the difference is, is that the lure lock tip has a bulky plastic shield around it, where the one on the right, the slip tip, um, doesn't have that circular shield so you can get approximation with the side of the syri syringe wall quite nicely. Um, and I'm going to draw your attention to a few things. So notice how the liquid flows in each. In the picture on the right, uh, in the green, I'm able to really take that slip tip, loader syringe, press it against the test syringe. In the left, I'm, I'm unable to get approximation of that tip of the loading syringe to the wall of the test syringe. And the difference here is that that the liquid is free pouring while the picture of the syringe on the right the liquid is running down the side of the test syringe and I found that as you're filling it this way um, this small difference in loading can really help with the struggle of getting uh, or eliminating bubbles in your sample and so I'm actually going to show you um, some live demo right now um, and Alan I am Ready and going Perfect. To start my video. Okay, so um, am I full screen, Alan? We're good. Yes, you're good. Perfect. All right, so what I'm going to show you really quickly are two ways of loading. And so here again, I have the um, lure lock. And as you can see, there's that plastic shield around the tip. And here I have the slip tip, which is my favorite, um, and it's easier for loading, and I'll show you why. So when, when I load, I always usually um, place the numbers towards me so that I can see exactly what I'm doing. Um, and I load this way. I take the tip, I block it with my pinky, and then I have access. And really, I'm, it's comfortable, it's a good way to load. So 
when I'm doing this, what I will do is I will press the side of the syringe right against the loading syringe. And this allows for nice liquid flow with no bubbles and no chunks. Rather than, I think a lot of people tend to just load like this and what you end up getting is bubbles within your sample. So you don't wanna do that. Now, the next way here, I'm gonna show you how to load with a um, lure lock. This is a little bit more difficult because again, you can't really eliminate those bubbles as well because I can't really get good approximation towards the, the wall of the syringe. And so with this, you'll sometimes get bubbles, not as much with a thicker liquid. Um, so I'm pretty good here, but anyway, I just wanna show you to kind of avoid Avoid a, you know, um, completely just putting it in and loading like this. I really would recommend trying to load against the side because that, that eliminates a lot of the bubbles that you're seeing. Um, one more example that I'm going to show you is um, basically that I just want to emphasize that just because a liquid can fill a syringe um, when you're loading it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be able to test the liquid. And so this is a uh, pudding that I had one of my colleagues save after we did video fluoroscopy uh, at the hospital. And so this is 100% weight to volume, so it's quite thick. Um, and I was able to get it into the syringe, but as you can see, it hangs up and you have a lot of bubbles. Um, and really, even if you bang it onto the counter, I still don't get all of the liquid flowing down. And so this is the time where, you know, loading in the middle just isn't really going to work. Um, and so I just want you to be aware of these kinds of things and that, you know, um, just because uh, the syringe was able to load, I can't get um, any flow. And so this is the point where you would move to um, a spoon tilt test or a, a fork test. All right, I am good to go. So Okie dokie. that is it for the live demo. And all right, so what I'm showing you here is another example of how loading can impact your sample. And so what I've done, this is um, a slightly thick liquid and I've loaded with a slip tip, but I placed the tip in the middle and just kind of let the liquid flow in rather than pressing it against the syringe. And you can see here that all of these bubbles add up. And so they really have the potential to impede the flow of your test. I really try to eliminate as many bubbles as possible when I test. So moving on to some frequently asked questions. Um, one of the questions, can I use a larger syringe? And I hope by now everybody is yelling no at their screen. You cannot use a larger syringe. Um, you have to make sure that the dimensions and the tip um, are correct and it's these standards. Um, can I reuse a syringe? Absolutely, you can reuse a syringe. The answer is yes. Uh, until it looks like this one here. Um, I'll often throw these guys away. They're old, clearly, um, you know, with repeated testing, you have wear and tear. I'll often use these as loading syringes, but really once the numbers rub off, it's time to open up a new package and throw this guy away. And so um, other questions, how many times can you run a liquid or should you run a liquid? Um, since the test, uh, requires very little sample, I really like to run my liquids three times um, and take advantage of the three runs. Uh, typically, if the liquid has a quite large outlier where the flow drops above or below the other runs, let's say by 10 milliliters or more, I'll rerun and replace that number. Um, so for example, if I'm running a liquid and I get two, um, 
two values of let's say five and 5.2, um, what I will do is I will then go uh, run my third test. If I get a result of let's say seven, um, that's pretty inconsistent from five. Um, so I'll go ahead and just run that again and hope that um, you know maybe uh, there was a lump or something like that. Um, and then I, you know, let's say I get 5.6, I'll use that instead and I'll average the three and that will be my test result for that particular liquid. Um, in terms of what timer should I use, I always, always, always use a touch timer. So when I first started testing, uh, I played around with a few button timers that I found in the lab, um, and I lost a lot of my runs to error this way because what I was doing was I was pressing the button um, and then not thinking that it had started, I would press the button again and stop the timer. So it's really, really finicky and you wanna make sure that you release your finger, your pinky finger that's covering the tip at the same time as when you're starting um, your testing. So that's something that you know I really recommend using a touch timer on your phone. Um, you will thank me, I promise you, if you're not already using a, a touch timer. All right, and how should I wash my syringes? So in terms of washing, um, what I'll do is I'll fill a sink with soapy water. Um, I usually do a lot of testing at the same time. If I'm, if I'm trying to make recipes and playing around with liquids, um, I will often um, be making a lot of liquids and using a lot of syringes. Um, so in terms of washing, again, I'll fill that sink with soapy water, warm soapy water. As soon as I'm done with the syringe, I throw it into the sink. Um, of course, I empty all of the barium out of it first because that's not good for the sink. Um, for each test, really even with the same liquid, even if I'm testing the same liquid, I'll use a clean syringe each time to ensure accurate flow. Um, and what I'll do is I'll pump the syringe with the plunger three times, and then I rinse with warm water um, twice through, and then I set them to dry. I'm going to mention something that's really important is that you never want to use a syringe that's still wet, so that still has water bubbles in the tip. Um, if, there are wa if there's water in the barrel and it's one little drop, um, you could probably get in there with some kind of um, towel, but you know, you have to be sure not to leave lint or any particles behind. Um, but I will often, um, you know, even if I see a little drop of water, I'll set that aside and use it clean syringe. Um, I just, I never like to dilute any of my sample or, you know, impede any of the flow or affect anything. So I really try to be careful with that. Now, tips for using contrast. So, um, I always add my barium to my liquid first. So this is kind of my rule. Um, I will have the water moving and I will add any of my dry components to the water. Um, and I always add the barium and thickener to that moving water um, to kind of ease that um, dilution of everything into the suspension. Um, I always, I try to follow thickener instructions. Sometimes it's easier said than done. Um, and I really ensure that there are no barium clumps when I'm using powdered barium. So what I do is I will, um, you know, have my weigh boat or a cup that's non-static um, and I will, you um, take a fork and really sift through the barium to make sure that it's not clumpy. Um, and another thing to be really aware of is that if you're using um, liquid barium to make a recipe, make sure that that liquid barium has been stirred or mixed quite well um, to make sure that you're getting a full suspension of whatever you're mixing. Um, but then also after the fact, make sure that before you itsy test the liquid and before you start flow testing, if you're using contrast and you have a suspension, make sure to stir that before you load your itsy syringe to then load into the test syringe um, because you don't want the the barium impacts the flow and I'll be talking a little bit about that um, in a few slides but when you are testing using barium and you're not um, 
and you're not, uh, you know, taking that barium and, and fully moving it within the suspension of, of the liquid, um, you're missing that barium. And so you're missing part of the flow characteristics. So that's something that I highly recommend. Um, the table here demonstrates ITSY syringe flow test results for Braco Verabar barium products. Um, and so this is really great for individuals in the US. We don't have Verabar in Canada. We have to make our own um, contrast uh, stimuli. But it's really great because while the figure shows, um, so the figure shows uh, flow tests for thin nectar uh, and thin honey and then honey. Um, but the results show that Verabar thin tests within a level zero. So it tests as a thin on the ITSY framework, meaning that the entire 10 milliliter sample has flowed out of the syringe in less than 10 seconds. Um, the Verabar nectar tested within the mildly thick range, and then the Verabar thin honey tested close to the upper boundary of the moderately thick range. And so this is really nice because you see a variety. Um, but when you see these results, it's, it's really exciting um, to know, you know, that the um, ITSY consistency levels fit with the Verabar liquids um, that so many speech pathologists use in the United States. Um, the Verabar honey results that you see in table two um, are in this table are shown with a question mark um, in probable classification as an ITSY level four, um, which would be an extremely liquid, uh, extremely thick liquid, excuse me. This product was really observed to produce two to three drips from the syringe uh, within that 10 second uh, flow test period. So when this sort of result is seen, it means that the liquid is testing right at the boundary between moderately and extremely thick. And so it's really too thick at that point to be tested using um, the syringe flow test. So the ITSY framework testing method instruction suggests that really a spoon tilt or a fork drip test should be then done just to confirm the flow characteristics at this level. Um, and again, I'll be talking about that um, in a couple of slides. It's important to note that if you're using Verabar and that's what your hospital uses, you really have one step done for you, which is uh, the creation of your own ITSY level consistencies um, with contrast for testing purposes. So now what you're going to want to do is make matching liquids that you can then offer to your patients after their video for home and for hospital use. So like I said, half of that work is done, you have these test consistencies, but now you need something to offer for, um, you know, home use or bedside use ingestion. Um, and so there's one thing missing from this slide, and that would be the level one or slightly thick liquid. Um, the recipe for a level one or slightly thick Verabar can be found here, like you can see. Um, and after this, we really have the full range of ITSY liquids for Verabar users. And it's great because really it's little to no alterations and very little prep. So 50% um, Verabar uh, thin with a 50% nectar will then give you a slightly thick liquid, so just great. Now we recently published an article in our lab um, that provides recipes with instructions and weight in grams for xanthan and starch-based thickeners with and without contrast. Um, the articles open access in dysphagia and provides uh, clinicians with an excellent starting point in terms of thickening for video fluoroscopy, but then taking those results to map to diet recommendations. And so because um, the settings and temperatures and wait times after mixing, mixing are all extremely important factors that impact flow. I'd suggest when I show you the recipes or when you find the recipes, um, just use them as guidelines for creating your own in-house recipes. And so here are the recipes um, that are provided within the, um, the publication that I just mentioned. Um, so it's a really nice starting point. Um, so start here, make your bear recipes and then once you cut out the contrast you'll likely find that you'll have to add more thickener to the uh, non-barium version as you can see here 
And so it's really interesting then in this sense to see the stark difference um, also in gum and starch for non-barium. So we can see essentially how much barium decreases the flow of liquids. And this is why it's so important to ensure that synchrony of our liquids from video fluoroscopy to in-home and hospital use because um, we have to add so much more thickener um, in the non-barium um, counterpart to match that uh, to match those flow levels, which is really interesting. Um, and so it just shows that you know barium does uh, alter the flow, and so we do need liquids that are um, different from those that we're using in in video. And I suggest usually using a twenty percent weight to volume. Um, these are all twenty percent weight to volume. The barium uh, contrast recipes that you're seeing here. I know Vera, uh, Vera Bar is forty percent, um, but since barium's meant to coat, it's really best to stick with a lower density and you'll also get um, a, a faster flow if, if that's something that you would like um, when making your recipes. So you might find the flow test doesn't work for liquids that are thicker if you are having trouble loading the syringe, uh, again because of that thickness or material sticking to the syringe, uh, like I showed you with the pudding not dropping and becoming level, you might have to transition to the spoon and fork tests for moderately and extremely thick liquids. So what you see here is using the fork um, test to see the coating both above and below the fork as shown on the slide. So you have the fork test on the left, the spoon test on the right. And so in the top left hand corner, um, level three will have a very small mound above the fork and a long thick tail whereas in the bottom left hand you have level four that has a mound that will really sit above the fork and a tiny tail but usually you won't see many drops or drips um, between the prongs now on the right hand side with the spoon test um, the moderately thick liquid in the right top hand corner um, really uh, flows off of the spoon and you can see that flow and it spreads out when it hits the surface um, of whatever you are um, testing onto. Um, whereas the stream, extremely thick liquid or the left hand or the right hand lower uh, side of the screen um, plops off of the spoon. And at times it might require a little flick to get the liquid moving, um, but it usually plops and sits in a mound on a flat surface. And so again, here are just some examples of the fork drip test. You can see level three dripping in strands through the prongs um, and level four sitting in a mound. I'm going to skip this slide um, and we're going to go right to mapping. Um, so one of the steps that, you know, ITSE believes might be helpful is to develop what they're calling currency converters. converters. So these will help clinicians and facilities to map from current practice to the new framework. And most people are using national dysphagia diet categories which can be found on the left um, and so this just basically shows how you can map um, those similar um, recommendations to the ITSI framework for drinks on the right. And I've included here some tips to help with mapping modification recommendations for patients after their video and after you know what texture levels you'll have, um, you'll be having them on so you can teach them how to mix. So I really recommend in hospital creating a kit with of syringes, practicing with them, um, providing links and also curating some recipes that they can take home and try, even if it's a simple smoothie, but making them thicker or thinner, um, depending on recipes that you have pre-made. And that way they have something to start off of. They may be a little bit more confident to make what you've given them at home, but then also play around on their own. So giving them that freedom um, and really autonomy over what they're ingesting and taking in. Um, at home, I would really encourage testing for them to familiarize to the test um, and really provide all of the resources ahead of time, the syringes, some thickener that you might recommend to them, um, and really encourage check-ins. I would also provide visuals um, in terms of those resources, so the ITSI framework, and I'm going to show you here something like a take-home package, um, really to 
have the patient family try on their own while you're there for questions, but also giving them a sheet saying, this is where you are. You are here. This is what you're going to be making at home. This is how you do it. And these are the resources and really facilitating their independence, helping them being there for troubleshooting and making yourself available. Um, really overall sheets with their targets based on current frameworks um, is really, really great because then they know what they uh, should expect. And just some real benefits of the flow test. The repeatability of this test is incredible. You can change and alter your recipes as freely as you would like. Um, it's so amazing to be able to match what you're giving the patient to what you're testing them with. And that's been something that we've struggled with for so long. Um, the technique is simple, it's fast. It can be used for a lot of levels of stickiness in terms of um, you know, the spoon tilt test and things like that. Um, small amounts of stimuli are really required for testing so you're not making big batches just to test one recipe that you may need to throw out if it doesn't meet your recommendations. Um, easy to teach easy to learn and it's really accessible it's inexpensive and it's cost effective and so I'm just going to leave you with some uh, resources here everything that I'm showing you can be found on the website there's an app an itsy app which is great um, there are posters that you can print and give to patients um, again everything is all on their website itsy.org and then Thickeners um, and companies are coming out with labels that include ITSY labeling on them. And so that transitions and helps us to transition into recommendations for patients. Um, there's also more on ITSY flow testing. Um, I wrote a uh, article with Dr. Steele on Dysphagia Cafe about um, syringe testing. And I'd like to thank you so much for tuning in. I also have to thank the ITSY board for the opportunity to share my experience with flow testing. Um, it's pretty amazing what they're doing for our field. And the initiative is really something that I believe in. So Thank you, Itzy, for your work, and I'm happy to take any questions with uh, Peter. Thank you so much, Carly, for that uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, we'll now move on to the question and answer period. So if you have any questions, uh, you can submit them by clicking the Q&A button on the middle of your menu bar at the bottom of your screen, and that'll submit them to the two panelists today. Uh, and just, um, we, we want to be respectful of everyone's time, so if we don't get a chance to answer all the questions, questions that come in, we will try to answer those in the upcoming newsletter that will be going out at the end of the month. So please make sure that you sign up for our eBytes and you can do that easily on the homepage of our website, itdsi.org. So uh, Peter, we have you on the phone call. Is that right? Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you very Perfect. much, Alan. Thank you for joining us. Uh, so I'm just gonna read these questions out loud and you can uh, take a style of them if you don't mind. So Gregory is asking, why not tilt this range 30 degrees or so when using the lure lock to fill? Hmm. I, I mean, Gregory, that's a good question. And, and you can definitely play around with that. Um, I was just, you know, I'm providing tips and tricks that have helped me. And so if you um, try tilting the syringe at 30 degrees, and you find that it really works to eliminate any of those bubbles, by all means, then that's, that's great. And perhaps I'll try it next time I'm in the lab. And, and, you know, thank you for the suggestion and the recommendation. And really, it's all about kind of finding your own way to test and um and i think you know your own way and methodology of doing things is, is really great because you can own that so yeah great thank you uh now this question came in twice actually so is there a reason um uh, that you're using two syringes to do the flow test or can you just load the fluid into the syringe that you're using uh directly from a cup uh a medicine cup or a spoon um I really don't recommend that in terms of the ease and the messiness um, and the uh, bubbles and things like that. I find that with a syringe, um, you're more precise. Um, you're not able to really control how much you're putting into the syringe if you're using um, a medicine cup to kind of fill. Um, if that's all you have and you're low on syringes, then I mean, you have to make do. But um, in terms of really controlling controlling uh, your liquid to get to that 10 milliliter line on your test syringe, I really recommend you using a syringe for, for accuracy of testing. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, can now, I just jump in, if, if, yeah. if, just to say that um, for, for some places in the world where 
uh, syringes are hard to come by. Um, yes, we, we do recommend that if they need to use um, just the one syringe and um, pour in the liquid, um, by all means, um, I think our, our, our main uh, encouragement to people really is uh, to, to use the testing method uh, really to ensure that the correct thickness of liquid is being actually offered uh, to their patients, to their family members, loved ones. Um, so um, the two syringe method as suggested by Carly is ideal, um, but yes, by all means, if there is another method that would be better to uh, use to fill the uh, 10 milliliter syringe, uh, for the ITSI flow test. Um, keep in mind that you can use a different size syringe, uh, turkey baster, whatever you wish to use, but as long as the flow is happening through that 10 mil syringe, um, that uh, would allow you to then be able to check the liquid thickness. Thanks, Peter, that's great. Um, now, Sharon is asking, uh, is she understanding correctly that you can reuse a syringe for testing? Correct. Perfect. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, how long can you leave the liquid sample in the syringe before testing? Mary is asking. That's a good question. I'll probably answer and then defer the rest to Peter. Um, in terms of leaving the liquid in the sample or the sample in the syringe before testing, that doesn't really um, matter unless you're looking at um, what kind of thickener you're using. So some thickeners take about 20 minutes to um, get to stability. Um, and so you have to be aware of time of testing um, and also temperature um, and also separation. Um, so if you notice that things um, are, you know, kind of falling to the bottom in terms of if you're using contrast, um, that's when I may either shake or, or really reload. Um, Peter, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Um, yeah, um, I think the caution would be that um, the liquid that you're testing um, is homogenous when you put it into the syringe. There are um, situations where uh, there may be some solutes in the liquids um, that may settle out over time. Um, we know uh, that there are some settings where people would pre-thicken the liquid, uh, leave it in the uh, cooler overnight, or leave it uh, somewhere for you know, a, a period of time where there may be a possibility that some of the uh, particles within the liquid will settle so that you get um, a bit of a different thickness at the bottom of the liquid just because of, of, of settlement with, with gravity. Um, so we do encourage that the, the product is um, mixed uh, properly before it is tested. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind uh, really is uh, there might be a change in the temperature of the liquid if you leave it from a chilled state uh, in a room temperature environment, and that actually may change the thickness of the liquid as well. Perfect. Thank you, Peter. Um, Sharon is asking, Carly, um, can you reuse the syringe between different products as long as you wash and dry the, the both syringes? Yeah, as long as they're washed and, and completely dry, you can absolutely use use the same syringe for sure. Perfect. And unless your syringe is, you know, coming off in terms of your levels um, where you're not able to read it as well, you can definitely reuse for sure. Great, thank you. Uh, Emily is asking, can you discuss appropriate methods for testing um, transitional foods that, that change consistency, for example, ice cream, and how do you determine which levels these foods fit into? Uh, Peter, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you take that one. <laughs> sure, Carly. Um, Emily, that's a great question uh, about testing transitional foods. Um, again, this is not going to be a simple answer just because um, we know that ice cream can start out in one state, in the frozen state, and with the change in temperature, will ultimately melt into um, a liquid product. So I think this is where it is very much um, the discretion of the clinician uh, when you're doing the assessment to try to determine 
can that person actually ultimately handle that transition or change in the product? Um, what people have done in terms of testing is actually allowed the ice cream to melt right down to the liquid state, um, put that into the syringe to test what the resultant effect of the melted ice cream would be, and then use that as the um, you know, lowest common denominator to determine should the ice cream completely melt in someone's mouth, can they actually still manage that level of thickness? Mm. So that's the best answer that I think we can give you at this point in time. Um, as I said, the use of ice cream is very much dependent on the clinician's discretion. Um, Carly, do you wish to add on to that thought? No, I think that was awesome. I, I completely agree with you. Um, Perfect. It's a difficult one, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Carly, you mentioned before that we should avoid talking about viscosity as opposed to flow characteristics. Can you elaborate on that a bit? Um, so basically when we talk about viscosity, it's essentially the measurement of viscosity is the resistance of a substance to flow under a force that's a applied to it. And so typically when viscosity is measured, we use rheometers, um, which are instruments that measure viscosity because they apply a force to a liquid. This causes, the, the force applied causes shearing um, of the liquid um, or deformation of the liquid. And the rate that this deformation occurs is called the shear rate of the liquid. And so really viscosity is a constant across a shear rate continuum. So the force that's being applied to those liquids, whereas flow is a whole different um, measure of, uh, of, of liquid measurement. Um, and so really those two things are quite different. Um, and so that's why I, I say to really step away from thinking in terms of um, viscosity, um, in terms of, you know, how much force we're applying to a liquid um, and looking at flow. Um, Peter, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, but um, just two, two different terms and really two different um, um, outcomes that we're looking at. Yeah, thanks, Carly. Um, for, for those who are looking further into uh, rheology, um, mm -hmm. one thing to keep in mind is that, um, you know, the behavior of the liquid uh, may change with um, the uh, increase or decrease in shear rate. Um, so when the NDD was developed, um, arbitrarily uh, 50 reciprocals per seconds, uh, 50 reciprocal seconds was, was picked as the sort of shear rate of, of choice um, to give people a starting point to look at, well, what would the viscosity be should we test all the liquids at 50 reciprocal seconds? Um, and what uh, has been seen is that when that shear rate is increased, um, the liquids can actually behave in, in a very, very different way. Um, when we look at the physiology of the swallow, um, you know, other components that we need to keep in mind are things like yield stress and also surface tension. Um, Dr. Ben Hansen's done some really, really incredible work uh, in this area um, to be able to demonstrate this. And for those people on the call who might be attending the uh, European Society of Swallowing Disorders Conference uh, in the next week. Uh, Dr. Hansen actually has a poster presentation about this uh, at the ESSD conference. Please come by and have a look at that. And once the conference is over, we'll be more than happy to post that uh, poster on the ITSI website uh, so that you can have access to it as well. So hopefully that helps to answer that question. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Harley. Uh, we are uh, almost running out of time, so I'm just going to read some of the simpler questions, if you don't mind, and then maybe we can take a stab at the more tricky ones or the um, more particular ones uh, through our e-bytes. So, Carly, Brid Bridget is asking, does temperature uh, of the fluid affect the flow? 
Yes, yeah, it does, absolutely. Um, I've done some preliminary testing at uh, room temperature, um, at refrigeration, and with heated liquids, and it definitely changes the flow of the liquid. Um, so you definitely want to be careful. And as Peter mentioned last night in last night's webinar, um, it's really important to be testing, uh, itsy testing, using uh, the liquid with which the temperature that it will be served at or be consumed at. So um, if, you know, if something's coming out of the refrigerator but doesn't get to the patient until, you know, an hour later or whatnot, or they're not eating it until it's room temperature, it's really important to have that flow test at room temperature. Great, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Michelle is asking, how far in advance can you prepare the liquids before service? Um, so it just, <laughs> that's a tough one. I think Peter, you'll probably agree. Um, because depending on what kind of thickener, um, depending on the liquid, um, and I don't know if you're talking about kitchens. Um, so Peter, do you want to touch on that? Um, sure. Yeah. Um, again, it, it depends on what the sort of desired serving temperature is. Um, we know that there are various types of thickeners that will have optimal times uh, recommended for, for thickening. Um, and when we've done our testing, we realize that um, there are products that will continue to thicken with time. So I think um, depending on the type of thickener that, that you use, uh, you may want to determine what is the optimal window uh, for preparing that product. And um, again, what we would suggest from a QA perspective um, is just to make sure that we sample and test the uh, flow of the product um, just before service. Um, and during the actual mapping phase as you're preparing for ITSI implementation, we probably would suggest that you also check um, what happens to the liquid thickness with change in temperature as you uh, sit that product um, at room temperature, whether it is uh, warming up to a certain temperature or cooling down to a certain temperature if you're dealing with uh, warm liquids. So um, again, that's the reason why we have presented everyone with the use of the ITSI flow test uh, to enable you to be able to check the liquid thickness. Perfect, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna read Barbara's question now how soon I get this question uh, often so I think it's worth um, answering this one how soon before these are made pre-thickened so that we don't have to do this or teach this to our clients hmm. um, <laughs> is that mostly a um, kind of a for Peter I think maybe in terms of industry I don't know yeah, um, I think as soon as you can, um, you know, as the world is embracing ITSI now, um, there are lots and lots of, of, of resources um, available on our website. Um, whether or not you are making your own thickened liquid or whether um, you are using a pre-thickened liquid, um, we often still ask people to verify um, because um, people may wish to make their own thicker liquids at home that do not require the use of a thickener. Um, and by giving them the tool to be able to check the liquid thickness, um, this really empowers them uh, to be able to then say, hey, you know, I, I can drink this too. I can drink that smoothie. I can drink that milkshake. Uh, or, you know, I can take my... Uh, porridge in the morning and liquidize it to this level so I can drink it instead of having to eat it. So um, I think it's important that we teach everyone um, the ability or, or the, 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 the skill to be able to do the flow test. Um, and if you feel that you wish to just refer them um, to a video, uh, please refer them to the ITSI YouTube channel. Uh, the flow test um, instructions are there. Uh, and it's a really, really easy way uh, to allow people to learn how to do the ITSI flow test. 
Perfect. <clears throat> Thank you, Carly and Peter. I think we, uh, just in the interest of time, we're going to have to uh, leave it there. So that marks the end of this webinar. Uh, if we did not get to your question, don't worry. We'll <clears throat> try to include those in our upcoming newsletter. Um, uh, just a reminder that Carly's presentation and a recording of the webinar will be available on our website and on our YouTube channel at the end of the week. Uh, if you know of anyone who would benefit or would be interested in this webinar, please share the recording with them. Um, if you visit our, our website, idsi.org, the resources tab, uh, you will find lots and lots of information on the flow test, um, how to order uh, some of the flow, card, uh, flow test cards as well. Uh, so please take a look at that uh, because I'm, I'm sure you will find that very, very useful and helpful in your practice. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much to Carly. Thank you for your very informative and interactive presentation and uh, to Peter Lamb from the IDDSI Board of Directors. And especially thank you to all the listeners for joining us this morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Um, we hope you found this information useful. Um, and that you're, you're now a big fan of the flow test, the IDDSI flow test. Uh, and that's it. We are signing off. Have a great rest of your day and week. And until next time, thank you, Carly. Thank you, Peter.